Ernest Nagel, Defending Atheism, Video 4. In this video, we're going to cover Part 5, The Argument from Religious Experience. Video 1 covers Part 1 and Part 2 of Defending Atheism, and the first two paragraphs of Part 3, the Cosmological or First Cause Argument. Video 2 covers the rest of Part 3, the Ontological Argument. Video 3 covers Part 4, the teleological argument, or the argument from design. And video 5 will cover part 7, Nagel's positive doctrine of atheism. Part 5. One further type of argument, pervasive in much Protestant theological literature, deserves brief mention. Arguments of this type take their point of departure from the psychology of religious and mystical experience. Those who've undergone such experiences often report that during the experience they feel themselves to be in the presence of the divine and holy, that they lose their sense of self-identity and become merged with some fundamental reality, or that they enjoy a feeling of total dependence upon some ultimate power. The overwhelming sense of transcending one's finitude, which characterizes such vivid periods of life, and of coalescing with some ultimate source of all existence, is then taken to be compelling evidence for the existence of a supreme being. In a variant form of this argument, other theologians have identified God as the object which satisfies the commonly experienced need for integrating one's scattered and conflicting impulses into a coherent unity, or as a subject which is of ultimate concern to us. In short, a proof of God's existence is found in the occurrence of certain distinctive experiences. So, here, Nagel's pointing out that sometimes people report the experience of being in the presence of God or the feeling that they lose their sense of self-identity and become merged with some fundamental reality, or the feeling of total dependence on some ultimate power. They then take this feeling as compelling evidence of the existence of God. And the second variation on this argument involves the sudden feeling of understanding God as the object which brings our life coherent unity, or the feeling that God should be the object of our ultimate concern. The idea is that proofs of God's existence is found in the occurrence of certain distinctive experiences. It would be flying in the face of well-attested facts, were one to deny that such experiences frequently occur. But do these facts constitute evidence for the conclusion based on them? Does the fact, for example, that an individual experiences a profound sense of direct contact with an alleged transcendent ground of all reality constitute competent evidence for the claim that there is such a ground and that it is the immediate cause of the experience? So, it doesn't make any sense to Nagel to deny that people have these types of experiences. They very much do have the experience. But, do these experiences really provide evidence for the existence of God? If well-established canons for evaluating evidence are accepted, the answer is surely negative. No one will dispute that many men do have vivid experiences in which such things as ghosts or peak elephants appear before them. But only the hopelessly credulous will, without further ado, count such experiences as establishing the existence of ghosts and pink elephants. So, Nagel is asking a question. Do people's religious experiences provide evidence for the existence of God? And then his answer, which is no. Many people have vivid experiences of things like ghosts or pink elephants, but no one counts these experiences as establishing the existence of ghosts and pink elephants. To establish the existence of such things, evidence is required that's obtained under controlled conditions and that can be confirmed by independent inquirers. Again, though, a man's report that he's suffering pain may be taken at face value. One cannot take at face value the claim, were he to make it, that's the food that he ate which is the cause, 
or a contributory cause of his felt pain, not even if the man were to report a vivid feeling of abdominal disturbance. So this is an interesting example, and I think it could be a little bit confusing if we're not careful. So we can take at face value someone's report that they're in pain. However, we can't take their claim at face value that the cause of their pain is the food that they ate. And this is even if the pain was in their stomach. Now, the reason for this is important to keep track of. And the reason is because there's no independent evidence apart from the person's claim to verify that their pain was caused from the food that they ate. Their pain could have been caused by the food that they ate, but it also could have been caused by any number of other unrelated things. To answer the question of what is causing their pain requires verification independent of their experience of the pain and even independent of their experience of eating the food. And similarly, an overwhelming feeling of being in the presence of the divine is evidence enough for admitting the genuineness of such feeling. It's no evidence for the claim that a supreme being with a substantial existence, independent of the experience, is the cause of the experience. So similarly, the feeling of a religious experience, it isn't enough evidence that a person is actually having, excuse me, the feeling of a religious experience is enough evidence that a person is actually having the feeling that they report, right? Having the feeling is enough evidence that a person is actually having that feeling that they say that they're having. However, the feeling that they report isn't evidence for the claim that God exists and is the cause of the experience. This is because there's no independent evidence to verify that the religious experience is caused by God. Their religious experience could have been caused by any number of other unrelated things. So it's not evidence that God exists. <laughs>